Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome in the name of the Lord Jesus to this service of worship as we come together to praise his name, to think about Jesus, to remember the good news, the gospel, the cross. And in that context, we'll also be um, baptizing Fred and Sam, hopefully later in this service. A warm welcome if you're a visitor here with us. It's lovely and great to have you with us. And a warm welcome if you're joining us on the stream as well. Just one health and safety announcement. We do have an open body of water here on the platform. So if you have a young child, please be aware of that during the service. And afterwards, um, fairly immediately, we'll put the covers on. But please do wait until that happens before you release them. Um, we don't want any accidents up here at the front. And also, just to let you know that there is a lunch afterwards in the hall. Please do stay for that, even if you haven't come prepared for it. It would be great to just spend that time together, um, enjoy each other's company. And we can talk together about the things that we've, we've heard and that we've seen this morning uh, through this service. We can encourage each other in the Lord. Let me pray. Time uh, to God. Father, we thank you for bringing us together this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to worship you, to praise you, to hear from your word, to see in pictures as we baptize Fred and Sam the reality of the good news of Jesus, what he means to us, what he does for us, who he is. Lord, we pray that you would bless our time together, that your Holy Spirit would work here among us and that we would know your presence. Amen. Psalm 117 says, Praise the Lord, all nations. Glorify him, all peoples. For his faithful love to us is great. The Lord's faithfulness endures forever. Hallelujah. There's an instruction there to glorify the Lord together. We're going to do that with our first song. To God be the glory, great things he has done. And then after we've sung this, Rob will come up with the children's talk. Let's stand and sing together.
Good morning. Um, I'll try not to walk around and I have a habit of walking around while I'm talking, so stay over here. Okay. Um, it's good to see everybody today. Um, loads of people in church, much more than normal, which is great. Um, normally we'd have all the kids up, but there's loads of people, so we'll not. So make sure you're listening from right at the back, right to the front. Okay, very good. So can anybody remind me what it is we've been looking at in the children's talks? This last little while, anybody? I'll give you the first word, people. Yes, Ned? People who met Jesus, very good. People who met Jesus, very good, right from the back. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about people who met Jesus. So today, we're going to, be th- we're going to think about somebody that was trapped. Um, has anybody here been trapped? I'll tell you a story about a time that I was trapped. Back when I was at university, which is where you go after school sometimes, if you want to delay going to work, um, <laughs> that's, that's where I was. And there was a whole, whole bunch of my friends. Uh, we studied engineering, so it was and one or two girls, um, but it was mostly boys, um, and we decided we needed breakfast, because, you know, one breakfast isn't enough, so we went at the very bottom in the basement of the, the, the building, it was like six or seven stories, um, there was a, a canteen, and they served a really good breakfast, um, and breakfasts in Northern Ireland are like, they're like, a, they're like a full English but with a lot more bread, so they're quite heavy. Um, so there was, I think there was about 15 of us all having breakfast, and then we left it until about one minute after we should have been in class to get up and, and find the elevator, or the escalator, or the lift. Um, so all of us, after having a big breakfast, went into these lifts. Now these lifts were quite special, they had names, um, one was called the Ghost Rider, and one was called the Silver Surfer, and they were quite bouncy, and I'm not quite sure that they met health and safety standards, but they were, that's how we got around. So we all piled into the lift, somebody pushed the button, it was fine, we started going up, and then we got to a floor, and the cleaning lady came along with her trolley, and she wheeled the trolley in to the lift, and we all were like, and she got in, and then we started moving up to the next floor, and then we stopped. And the doors didn't open, and we were in the lift. We pushed the button to, to tell somebody to come and rescue us. Pushed the button, rang a phone call. He was like, yeah, I'm 45 minutes away. He was like, on the, other side of, on the other side of Belfast. So he had to make his way over. We were all stuck in this lift, just having had breakfast. Um, and with the cleaning lady on her trolley, um, all stuck in this lift. And then eventually this man came. Um, I'm not sure you're supposed to do this, but somehow he prized the doors open and the lift was like not at the floor where it's supposed to be. It was like halfway where it's supposed to be. And he threw a chair down and then we all climbed out of the lift and, and, and got out of the lift. So we were stuck, we were trapped in this lift. Um, it was quite an experience. I, I, I still am a little bit nervous about lifts. Um, and I'll take the stairs if, if it's not too far. Um, <laughs> but it was, um, that was, a pic- that was me being trapped, and a whole bunch of us being trapped. It wasn't great. And then we all walked into last class like 20 minutes later, even it was like 10 minutes before the end. Um, and it, yeah, it would, so that was that was how we were trapped. We've got a, I've got a story about somebody who was trapped um, uh, in today, and somebody who met Jesus because they were trapped. So I'm going to read a little bit of it. Um, And then we'll talk a little bit about it. So, uh, this one, it's where Jesus has been. Jesus just um, calmed the storm, and he was on the sea of Galilee, calmed the storm, and was making his way to shore. So, so the disciples had seen this guy, Jesus, have authority over the weather and calm the storm. So, they'd seen that Jesus was somebody special. So, um, they went across the Sea of Galilee, so this is just after the storm, to the area of, of the Gazarenes. Jesus got out of the boat. A man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. The man lived in the tombs. No one could keep him tied up anymore. Not even a chain could hold him. 
His hands, his feet had often been chained, but he tore the chains apart, and he broke the iron cuffs on his ankles. No one was strong enough to control him. Night and day he screamed among the tombs in the hills. He cut himself with stones. So this is a guy who was trapped. Um, he didn't have control of his, of his mind or his body. Um, the Bible tells us that he lived in tombs, which is not a very nice place to live. Um, and this guy was, I'm sure, terrified um, of, his, of, of the way he was living. And he didn't have control of what he did um, because his, he didn't have control of his mind, which is, I'm sure, really scary. And I'm sure the people around him that, that kind of lived in the area around him were scared of him too. Um, the fact that um, they tried tying him up was probably not for his own good. It was probably to try to keep him away from them because they didn't really like him, because they were terrified of this guy. Um, this guy was completely trapped. He was trapped in his mind. He was trapped in that he couldn't live with his family, couldn't live with his friends, um, and he was stuck. Um, and then the Bible tells us, so this is the guy who's living there where Jesus has just kind of come up um, on his boat um, with his disciples. And when he saw Jesus a long way off, he ran to him, he fell on his knees, in front of him, he shouted at the top of his voice, Jesus, son of the most high God, what do you want with me? Promise before God that you won't hurt me. This was because Jesus had said to him, come out of, of this man, you evil spirit. So this man, the thing that was controlling um, the devil or Satan that was controlling this man knew that Jesus was somebody special. He knew that Jesus had authority over him. And, and, and the thing that was causing so much distress of this man was scared of Jesus because he knew that Jesus could fix this man and make this man better. And, that's, and Jesus commanded this, this thing, this, this illness, this, um, this um, evil spirit to come out of Jesus. And then the Bible tells us, um, it goes on a little bit, but the man was made better. The man was healed. This evil spirit came out of him. Um, and it says that the people... Um, wanted to see all this that was going on, and they came to see Jesus, and they saw the, and they saw the man who had been cr controlled by many demons. He was sitting there, and now dressed and thinking clearly. All this made the people afraid. So this man, who was crazy, for want of a better word, who didn't have control of his mind, who was terrified of where he was, he met Jesus. And Jesus was able to heal him. Jesus was able to fix him. Jesus was able to get this problem out of him um, because Jesus has authority over it. And Jesus, if we look back at, he healed, he, he um, calmed the sea. He, he, he had control of the weather. And in this case, he had control of the spirit that was controlling this man. And this man was in his right mind. He was, he was now able to have a conversation with someone. Um, and he was now able to, um, to just be behave in, 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 an, in a normal way. Um, and, then, and then it goes on to say, um, Jesus was getting onto the boat. So after all these things has happened, Jesus was getting back in the boat to go somewhere else. Um, Jesus was getting into the boat. The man who had been controlled by demons begged, begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him. He said, go home to your family. Tell him how much the Lord has done for, for you. Tell him how kind he has been to you. So the man went away in the area known as the Ten Cities. He began to tell how much Jesus had done for him, and all the people were amazed. So this man, who didn't have control of his mind, who was terrified, who was living among tombs, um, Jesus fixed him. Jesus got this, this fixed this problem. Um, and then he was able to go around and tell his friends and tell all the people in the area that he lived how great Jesus was and how much Jesus had done for him. And that's, that's great. And that's what's happening today. Um, what's happening today is um, Sammy and Freddie are telling everybody how kind Jesus is, how much Jesus has, has done for, for them. And Jesus has. Jesus has taken our sins away. So we've all got a problem where we've got sin in our hearts. And Jesus has promised that if we ask for forgiveness for those sins, he will forgive us. Um, Jesus has authority over that, just like he had authority over this man's problem. And that's great. That's a, 
a really great thing to remember and something to remember whenever um, these guys are getting baptized. You hear what they're, they're talking about, about um, what Jesus has done for them. It's just like this man in the story, about how much Jesus has done for, for him. All right, we're going to pray and then we're going to sing a song. Okay, let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you have authority over all of our problems. We thank you that you love us and that you're kind to us. And we thank you that you're willing and able to forgive our sins. And we just pray that you would help us all to understand that. Um, and that you, we just pray that you would um, help us to understand how much you want to help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're going to sing a song. I'm not chained up, I am free. Okay, I'm going to go back. baptism? Why baptism? Well, the Bible tells us when somebody becomes a Christian, when someone puts their faith in Jesus, uh, they are to be baptized. They are to be baptized as a statement of that faith. We might use the word profession of that faith and commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible tells the church that when someone becomes a Christian, they should baptize them as a recognition that they are now a Christian, that they have been saved through God's grace. And baptism is a picture, uh, a picture that God's given us of what it means to be saved, to be washed clean of our sins. So when someone gets baptized, they are professing that they put their faith in Jesus and the church is picturing the reality of their faith in Jesus. I think that's really important because what that means is that baptism doesn't make you a Christian, but baptism is a recognition of being a Christian and a statement of being a Christian. And I want you to have that in mind. Um, as we get to the baptism later, uh, Sam and Fred... Don't become Christians by going into the, the baptistry. Uh, they're going into the baptistry because they already are Christians. They've already put their faith in Jesus. And to help us to understand how that took place, um, I'm going to ask each of them to come and share now their testimony, their story of faith, how they came to put their faith in Jesus. So Fred's going to go first, and then Sam straight afterwards. Thanks, Fred. Hello, I'm Freddie Johnson, and this is the story on how I became a Christian. I grew up in the church, as most of you know. I've gone to all the youth groups, and I was also taught the Bible and the stories from it by my parents for as long as I can remember. Looking back, I would normally only be going, for example, to Monday Club for the games or the possibility of a fizzy drink. And when the talk would come around, I would just switch off or focus on something else. This more or less stayed the same until I left primary school and became part of Wipeout. I found that sitting with my friends instead of my parents and not having any toys or things to play or fiddle with caused me to listen and even once in a while take some notes. But even though I was listening and maybe taking the tiniest bit in, ask me ten minutes after the service what the topic the preacher was talking on, I probably couldn't answer it. So time passed and then one day something changed. I was in my room playing when my grandma walked in. 
We spoke for a while about general things until the topic turned to Christianity, and she asked me a question that stumped me. Are you a Christian? I moved the conversation on and didn't really answer the question, but it stayed in my mind. And when I was in bed that night, I thought to myself, I'm not a Christian, and I should be. So at that moment, I prayed to God and asked him for the forgiveness of my sins. I realised that day that I was a sinner, and the only way to heaven was through Jesus. At first, I didn't really notice anything out of the ordinary about being a Christian. I thought everything would be different. But then I realised I am still a sinner, even with Jesus. So I asked, him, I asked for help to be more like him, and I've done that every day since. When I saw that one of the questions Jeff gave me to help my, write my testimony was, how, did your, how is your life now that you're a Christian? I'll be honest, I didn't really know what to say, as I'm only 14 and haven't had much time yet as a Christian, but I'm excited to find out as I walk in my Christian life and grow closer to Jesus. Cheers. So, as many of you know, I was brought up in a Christian household where almost all my wider family are Christians. And so throughout my life, I've been very heavily influenced through all, th all their Christian faiths, which I'm very thankful to God for. So because of my upbringing, I've basically attended church every Sunday since I was born, along with all the youth groups. And so naturally, I was quite familiar with the stories of the Bible. I can almost definitely tell you that Jesus died on the cross to save our sins, even if I didn't truly believe it. Yet even being brought up so close to the truth of the Bible, it never really affected me. And I was so used to going to church that the significance of the Bible and its teachings really just felt like normal and nothing special at all. And for many years, church, praying and reading the Bible was just a thing I did because my family did. And even when I went to church, I never really tried to listen as the majority of the time I just zone out as soon as the sermon started. The thing is, I've never really doubted the existence of God or the uh, teachings of the Bible. And I knew that the only way to get to heaven is through Jesus. However, I never really acted on it and I just thought I'd get baptised at some point in the future when it became convenient. And so for a long time, I was slowly drifting further and further away from Jesus, not really taking in any of the sermons or the children's talks, and just carrying this normal as if church didn't happen on a Sunday. Until a couple of months ago, I felt like everything was going quite well, and I noticed there were many things I was quite thankful for. And for some reason, I just decided that I might try properly listening to the sermon on Sunday, even taking some notes. It was my dad preaching, and he was preaching on one drum, as he always does, and the title was, The Source of Our Faith. There was one thing that Dad said that stuck in my head. He said, It is God who gives us the eyes to see the truth and the obvious, and that he comes into our, our lives and not the other way around, and we don't let, allow him into us. It made me realise that God had opened my eyes, and in that moment, everything that I'd already been taught in my life became clear, and instead of being something completely irrelevant to me, it was something personal. And it made me realise on a personal level that all the work had already been, already been done for me, death had already been defeated, the only thing I had to do was recognise my sin and ask for forgiveness. Um, I'm not sure if that's a turning point of me becoming a Christian, but it was definitely the start of something completely life-changing. And over the past couple of months, my faith and love for God has grown more and more. And I can tell you that the fulfilment that Jesus gives in my life, the gift of grace he gives all of us, and the reassurance that he is there loving us more infinitely than we can ever imagine, is most certainly the best thing ever to happen. Not just to me, but I'm sure that every Christian in this room <clears throat> and every Christian that has ever lived would say that the, sac the sacrifice of Jesus is the most personal, the most life-changing, and the most loving thing ever to happen. The thing is, I know none of us are perfect, and although I can tell you that Jesus is always ready to forgive, no matter who you are, where you are, or what you've done. And through God opening my eyes to see these amazing truths, he has made me a Christian. And that's why I've asked to be baptised as a public declaration of my faith, and also to show anyone who isn't a Christian by following Jesus is the best decision they'll ever make. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for the good news of Jesus. We thank you for what he does in our life. As we were reminded in the children's talk that he sets us free, he sets us free from our sin, the guilt of our sin, the grip of our sin, sets us free from judgment for our sin and gives us a hope of knowing you today and for all eternity, of living in your presence without fear now and forever. We thank you that he gives us that hope through his death and through his resurrection. 
through giving himself in our place and paying the price of our sin, through defeating sin, death, and the devil at the cross. Lord, we thank you that that victory has been won. And as we put our trust in Jesus, we receive all of the spoils of that battle. We receive every blessing that you give in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that that is true for Sam and Fred. And as they come today to, to be baptized, Lord, we thank you. And we, we, we just rejoice with them in your work of grace in their life. Of the change that you have made, the difference that you have made. Not just day by day, but forever. We thank you for that. And Lord, as we come together today, we recognize the importance of the gospel. We recognize the importance of others hearing the gospel. And Lord, as we've been praying over the weeks for um, the different Christian unions in universities where uh, members from the church are involved, we thank you, Lord, for the work that you were doing in Cambridge over the last couple of weeks, for the people that have heard the gospel through the witness of the Christian Union there. We thank you the same uh, for the Music College in London. Lord, those who came on Wednesday and heard about Christ. We pray, Lord, that you would be bringing fruit from that work. We pray for the Christian Union this week in Nottingham as they seek to share Christ with, with uh, people on the campus. We pray, Lord, that you would equip them, you would empower them, you would help them, you would guide them, you would direct them. And that, Lord, you would be present in every single one of those meetings. Present to work your grace and your goodness and point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the gospel. Lord, may we know how incredible it is today. Amen. Well, we're going to sing now a song that Sam has chosen uh, before we come to God's word. By faith, we see the hand of God in the light of creation's grand design. Shall we stand and sing?
a turn now to read the Bible. The, the words will be on the screen, but if you want to look it up in uh, your own Bible or on your phone or device on an app, uh, we're looking at Acts 16, verses 16 to 34. That's what we're going to read together. And then particularly, we're going to focus on verses 25 to 34 as we, we think this morning about what God wants to say to us in this service. So let's read from verse 16 of Acts 16. Once, as we were on our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She made a large profit for her owners by fortune-telling. As she followed Paul and us, she cried out, "'These men who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation,' are the servants of the Most High God. She did this for many days. Paul was greatly annoyed. Turning to the Spirit, he said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out right away. When her owners realized that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, bringing them before the chief magistrates, They said, these men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against them. And the chief magistrate stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had severely flogged them, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to guard them carefully. Receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundation of the jail was shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself since he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out in a loud voice, Don't harm yourself, because we're all here. The jailer called for light, rushed in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. He escorted them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him, along with everyone in his house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, he and all his family were baptized. He brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire family household. Amen. Now, I don't know if you've noticed that there's lots of things that we do all the time that we take for granted or we see as ordinary. But if we dig into them a little bit, we discover they are actually quite extraordinary. For instance, holding your head up, looking around, Pretty much all of us are holding our head up. Our head weighs around five to five and a half kilograms. It's, it's balanced on seven vertebrae. And it takes 20 muscles constantly working to hold your head up. Something very ordinary, but really isn't. Or frowning. Yes, looking out, most of you are frowning right now. Did you know it takes 43 muscles to frown? When you're tired, when you're grumpy, remember it only takes 13 muscles to smile. It's a lot easier to smile than it is to frown. Or let's think about taking one step, just one step. From the time that we were young, we can take steps. Well, most of us can. It's just we get out of bed and we take a step. We stand up and we take a step. Did you know it's 200 muscles for that one step to happen? 
It seems very ordinary, but when you dig in, actually, it's quite extraordinary. Today might seem very ordinary. Here's Sam, and here's Fred. They've been coming to this church for a long time, since they were born. Their parents are Christian and have taught them about Jesus since they were born. They've learned about Jesus for years. And it might seem that just them coming up here and saying, we want to be Christians and we want to be baptized and we want to be part of this church, that might just seem a very ordinary thing. They've grown up here. Of course they want to be part of the church. Of course they want to learn more about Jesus. But I want to say this morning, there is nothing ordinary about someone becoming a Christian. There is nothing ordinary about someone becoming a believer in Jesus. There is nothing ordinary about someone coming to that place where they want to follow Jesus. Baptism is about someone becoming a Christian. Therefore, there is nothing ordinary about baptism. And I want to show you that today by having a look at the account that we've just read from verse 25 to 34 in Acts 16 about a Philippian jailer and his family and how they came to this place of becoming Christians and then being baptized. And as we do so, hopefully we'll see that there is nothing ordinary about today. So what does this passage tell us about today? What does this passage tell us about the significance of today? Well, first of all, it tells us that today is a day of monumental importance. Today is a day of monumental importance. The heart of this passage, the center of this passage, is a question that the jailer asks Paul and Silas. He says this, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's the heart of the passage, that question. What must I do to be saved? Now, what question is he asking here? It's possible that he's asking, how do I get out of this sticky situation I find myself in? So he's a Roman jailer, and something has from his perspective, bad has happened in the jail. All the locks have come off the doors. Um, <coughs> all the prisoners are now free, although they're still there. And as a Roman jailer, how, he would, how, how would he be treated when the Roman authorities discovered something like this? He would be killed. So that's why he's committing suicide at the point um, in the verse earlier. He would be killed if a prisoner escaped. So he's in big trouble in kind of with the Roman authorities around him. So it could be he's asking, what do I do to get out of this sticky situation? Or he could be asking, how do I get right with God? How do I get right with God? Paul and Silas have been in Philippi, the city, for a while now. They've been teaching about God. And maybe the Roman jailer has heard about that. He's heard their message. And now it's suddenly all making sense, and he's asking the question, how do I get right with God? The slave girl earlier, the reason why Paul and Silas are in prison, she was saying they are servants of the Most High God, and the salvation that they are teaching, this is what it's all about. Maybe he's heard that. Or maybe it's simply that the prison has been shaken violently, and he realizes this is a work of God, and he's afraid. Is he asking, how do I get out of this sticky situation with my superiors? Or is he asking, how do I get right with God? I don't think we can actually answer that question from his mind because we're not told. But we do know what question Paul answers. Look at verse 31. Paul and Silas said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. What's the significance of that? Well, let's just take a step back. The Bible begins with creation. 
The Bible begins with God making everything and making everything perfect and good. That's how everything starts. And then as we get through chapter 1, chapter 2, and into chapter 3, we have Adam and Eve, and they sin against God. They break his commands. And the result is that they are ashamed. There's a separation between them and God. And the whole world in which we live is then put under a curse. That's the world in which we live. And as their children are born, their children are born in sin, with a natural rebellion against God, and a desire to do what is wrong in God's sight. And that's the case all the way down to us. And so the Bible teaches that we're born separated from God, we're born sinners in his sight, and that we can't do anything about that. I don't know how many of you um, car drivers have ever aquaplaned. I remember the first time I aquaplaned it, I'd only been driving, well, I passed my test the year before, and then I got a car, I'd only been driving about a month or two, and I came down from um, Watford Underground Station, there's a hill that goes under the the bridge, the train line, and uh, there was a big puddle. And I didn't know what aquaplaning was, I had no idea about it, and so I hit this puddle, and the car just span. And spat. I had no control. I could do nothing about it. Well, the Bible says we are spinning towards judgment with God, and we can do nothing about it. But the situation isn't hopeless, because God has done something about it. God came into this world in the person of his son. God came in Jesus who lived the perfect life, who died for our sin, who rose again and invites us to come and put our trust in him. And if we do, we will be saved from our sin, made right with God. And our future is not judgment, but it's eternal glory with Jesus. That's the question that Paul answers. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So I want you to realize today is not ordinary. Something monumental has taken place in Sam and Fred's life. They've been saved from their sin. They've been made right with God. And that is pictured in the baptism as they go under the water. They're washed clean of their sin. And they are no longer careering without, out of control into judgment from God, but they are held in his loving arms as his children. And you know, the same can be true for every single one of us here. That invitation, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. There's no limits on that invitation. Paul doesn't say, if you are this kind of person, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. No, any kind of person, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. So it's a day of monumental importance. Secondly, it's a day of miraculous power. It's a day of miraculous power. There are two miracles in this chapter. In Isaiah 64, verse 1, there's a prayer. I love this prayer. It says, if only you would tear the heavens open and come down. The prayer is that God would tear open the heavens and step into this world and do something. There are two occasions in this story where we see that clearly. God tearing open the heavens and doing something. The first miracle I want to call the attention grabber. It's the earthquake in verse 26. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains came loose. It's night time. All the prisoners are in their cells. They're locked away. The jailer's in his house next door. And suddenly there's this great, massive earthquake. Now, how many of you like getting birthday presents? Anyone? Only a few. Look, notice everyone who's got their hands down. Don't buy them birthday presents. What do you like doing when you get a birthday present? You you hold it in your hand. It's wrapped. Are you someone who just goes straight in there and unwraps it? 
Or are you someone who gives it a little shake? Anyone give it a little shake? I remember one occasion, my grandparents bought my aunt a present, and she gave it a bit more than a little shake. And the shock on their face, because it was a decorated egg. That, <laughs> and it was broken when she opened it. But his, his God basically taking the prison and shaking it violently. And shaking the locks out and shaking the, the, the stocks apart so that all the prisoners are free. That's a miracle. And as God does that, he grabs the attention of the jailer. There's also a second miracle in this passage. And it's found in verse 33 to verse 34. The jailer took them, so they've answered this question uh, about how can I be saved. They taught something from the word of God. And then the jailer took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away, he and all his family were baptized. Why were they baptized? Well, the next verse tells us. He brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. They were baptized because they now believed in God. So, so they've heard about Jesus. They then believe Jesus. Uh, I'd love to hear the conversation when they say, now we want to get baptized. Where do we go? We know there's a river outside Philippi. Did they kind of go in the middle of the night to the river? Or is there somewhere else where they could be baptized? But they, they've heard and they believed and they baptized. Can you see the miracle? Can you see it? No, but it's there. If we go a little bit earlier in the passage, we see something that has to happen for someone to move from hearing to believing. And if it's not there, that step won't take place. Early in the passage, the first person that Paul shared the gospel with that we know of in Philippi was a lady called Lydia who was at a place of prayer. And we're told in verse 14, a God-fearing woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, was listening. And this is what happened. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying. See, the Bible teaches that because we're born in sin, we are born deaf and blind to spiritual things. And in order for us to understand the gospel in a spiritual way and to trust in Jesus, God must enable us to see and to hear. I remember talking to a, a surgeon once, an eye surgeon, who, who said that um, from his perspective, the, the best pound-for-pound pound surgery that you can do is cataract surgery. Because it's relatively cheap, it's fairly quick, but it makes a massive difference. You know, when, when the cataract grows across your eye and, and, and the, kind of the scales come down on your eye and, and your vision slowly goes until the point where you cannot see, and then the surgeon comes in and slices away the lens and puts a new lens, and after a little bit of recovery, you can see such a difference. Well, for us to see the truth of Christ, God has to remove the scales and put a clear lens in place. He has to open our ears so that we can hear. Or, or in this case, it's described as a new heart that's given. In the Old Testament, it speaks about the heart of stone being taken away and a heart of flesh that's given. For someone to move from hearing to believing requires a miracle. It requires God stepping in and doing something in their life. And so we have two miracles in this passage. There is the attention grabber, the earthquake. But there is the changed heart as the jailer and his family come to believe. And I want you to realize that today, this is not ordinary. Think of Sam and Fred's testimony. 
Do you notice the miracles? Do you notice the miracles that were there? The attention grabber. It's a little bit more subtle than picking up the prison and shaking it, but it's still there. One of the things that we notice here as our young people come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is as we hear their testimonies, um, it almost sounds like it's scripted. It isn't, but they all say, I used to go to the clubs and Sunday schools. It was fun, and I enjoyed the games. Fizzy drinks, that's the first time that's been mentioned, but uh, I enjoy the games. But then, suddenly, I started listening to the teaching. Why? Because God has grabbed their attention. God has done something. And then there comes a point, and it might be gradual, it might be, it might be sudden, it's different for different people, and it's, God just leads us in different ways. But there comes a point where that person puts their faith in Jesus. Why? Because God has done a miracle and opened eyes, and opened ears, and changed the heart so that they can believe. Sam and Fred are getting baptized today because God has done something dynamic and massive in their hearts and in their lives. This would not be possible if God hadn't worked. So it's a day of miraculous power. And then thirdly, it's a day of massive joy. It's a day of massive joy. Look at verse 34. He, the, the Philippian jailer, brought them into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had come to believe in God with his entire household. He is happy. He is joyful because now he believes in God, because now he believes in Jesus, because now he has been saved. I think that's important. Knowing Jesus brings joy. In Psalm 16, verse 11, it says, You reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. In God's presence is joy. At your right hand are eternal pleasures. There are different emotions or different Ways that, that Christians should be in Christ. That there should be a, a sense of a seriousness about a Christian. Because God is holy. You know, as we come together to worship, we worship our holy God. And so there should be a, a certain sense of seriousness. There should be occasions of weeping and crying. Because we are sinful and the world is broken. And that should grieve our hearts. But we should also be happy and joyful because God is good and in Christ we're forgiven and we know Jesus who is the source and giver of joy. I remember one testimony at a baptism, not, not at this church, at a, a different church. A, a lady who had started coming to church with her daughter, then she'd become a Christian and been baptized. And she shared her testimony. How did all this happen? And she said one day she was walking down the street outside the church building and she noticed the people coming out. <clears throat> and what she noticed about them was they were smiling. And each Sunday morning she would do that same walk and every time they came out they were smiling. And what brought her to come into church and hear the message was I want to be happy like they are happy. Being a Christian is a joyful thing. Knowing Jesus brings joy, but I want you to notice, if we go right to the beginning of this passage in verse 25, knowing Jesus brings deep joy. Here we find Paul and Silas in prison. I want you to imagine you're one of the, the prisoners, the other inmates who are there. Um, you've been there a while. I'm not going to tell you what you're in for. You can imagine what you're in for. Um, but you're feeling pretty miserable. It's a horrible place. It's damp. It's dark. It's dirty. The food is not the best. And they didn't they fired the five-star chef, and they've just got a one-star one now. So the food is not the best. And everybody is pretty grumpy and angry. And in come these new inmates, and you know what's going to happen to them. They're either going to be sad, 
or they can be angry, or maybe they'll be that group that have the quiet acceptance. Sad, angry, quiet acceptance. But then they start singing. They start praising. And there's joy coming from the central cell where they are. What is going on? How can that be possible? Because they know Jesus. And Jesus gives a joy that can be experienced and known even when our circumstances are at their most tragic. It's a deep joy. As we gather today, this is not ordinary. There's something monumental. Sam and Fred have been saved from sin. There's something miraculous. God has worked in their life. And there is something massive. God has opened the door to a joy that is out of this world, a joy that Sam and Fred are tasting, but over the years we pray that they will know more and more deeply. And then for us all, as we step into eternity, if we're in Christ, we will experience in its fullest measure. And can I say again today, the same can be true for you. That invitation... In verse 31, there are no limits. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Baptism, what is it? It's getting in a pool of water, going under, coming back up. Done it at the swimming bars many times. Very ordinary, isn't it? But the reality speaks of is extraordinary. Today is a day of monumental importance, miraculous power, and massive joy. Can I say, if this is something new to you or different to you, uh, maybe you have questions. If you do, please do ask them. Don't feel you can't. Ask me, ask someone here that you know from the church. Please don't feel that you're putting on us by asking those questions. We love to talk to people about Jesus. And we'd love for you to ask us those questions. Shall we pray? Father, help us to see today as you see it. Help us to understand today in terms of the gospel and what has taken place in in lives in Fred and in Sam. What you have done in them and what you have now brought them into by bringing them into Christ and into your family, into the joy of knowing you. Father, let us celebrate that as we baptize them in a few moments. Amen. Well, we're going to now sing um, the song that Fred chose for this morning, Christ, our hope in life and death. Shall we stand and sing, and then um, Doug and Jeff will get into the pool and uh, do the baptisms.
So we've had the, uh, had the privilege, haven't we, of listening to them give their testimony. And now as a church, we get uh, the privilege of baptising them both as well. So it's very simple. I'm just going to ask them a question. Uh, they will, I hope, answer in the affirmative. And then we'll baptise them. And then we'll, we'll do Freddie first, and we'll do Sam, and then Jeff will pray for them both afterwards. Please. So, uh, Well, please feel, uh, feel free if you want to, to clap or express uh, joy after each baptism. That's absolutely fine. So... <laughs> So, first, Freddie, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour and do you promise to obey him as your master and lord? I do. Then, on your confession of faith in Christ as your saviour and on your promise of allegiance to him as your lord, we baptise you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Sam, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour and do you promise to obey him as your master and Lord? I do. Then on your confession of faith in Christ as your saviour and on your promise of allegiance to him as your Lord, we baptise you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Shall we, uh, shall we just pray? Father God, we want to thank you for what you have done in the lives of Sammy and Freddie. Thank you for the way you revealed yourself to them. Thank you for the many things that they knew uh, and yet had not accepted until you opened their hearts and opened their eyes. And we thank you for working in that way. I want to thank you for, for Doug and Jess and for Jamie and Carrie and their prayers over the years. We want to thank you for the prayers of the wider family too, and for the church family as well, that you have answered in bringing these young men to salvation. We want to pray, Lord, that you would be with them as they grow in their faith, as they walk with Jesus each day. Please, Lord, would you go with them? Would you give them the strength that they need, the courage that they need, the humility that they need uh, to live for Jesus each day? Thank you, Lord, that you've made these cousins brothers. And thank you, Lord, that you've made them brothers to all who are yours here and all who are yours. And we just ask, Lord, that they would be a blessing to us here, blessing in their families, blessing wherever you take them, but also that we would be a blessing to them too. And we commit them to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> We're going to close our time together by praising God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Let's stand and sing.
we thank you for your grace. Thank you for being with us by your spirit this morning. Thank you for the reminders of Christ. We pray, Lord, that we would know your peace, your joy, hope in Jesus as we go through today and into the week. Amen.